Wagner composed everything at the piano, and uh, from 1853 on until the end of his life, at a piano which was given to him um, by Liszt, but by Madame Erard. Liszt had a very close relationship with the Erard Piano Company in Paris, and um, Wagner asked Liszt for a piano. And Liszt got the ARs to give Wagner a piano. In typical Liszt manner, he was not only generous enough to give Wagner a piano, but to make it look like that someone else had given it to him. So it was sort of doubly generous. This happened again, by the way, in 1876. I'm sure many of you have been to Von Fried and see the, the 1876 model Steinway, which is in, in the big hall at Von Fried, which was not Wagner's personal piano, but it was the piano that was the official. His personal piano was upstairs. The ARs was up in his composing room. This was the official piano. Um, I played a concert on this piano. I played a lot on the Erard. I was the first pianist, pianist in the 20th century, actually, to play on Wagner's Erard. Um, this was also a gift from Liszt, although officially it was a gift from Steinway Company. Steinway made this new model of concert grand, which is really the first modern concert grand, in 1876, and gave 10 to Liszt, the first 10, numbers 1 through 10. And Liszt had them give one of them for the opening of the Byron Festival. So once again, the gift was really from Liszt, although officially it was from the Steinway Company. Liszt was a uniquely generous uh, colleague. Anyway, so Wagner, for all of his life, sat at the piano and wrote things at the piano. And what he did, he always had the text, and he wrote the, the initially, this seems amazing for someone who wrote as complex a music as he did, as orchestrally conceived a music as he did, and as polyphonic music as he becomes. Polyphonic, I mean simply, there's, a, there's more than one thing going on at a time. It's a big word that just simply means there is, there is more than one uh, thing happening musically at a time. Or, I guess even a better definition would be that you cannot reduce all the musical activity to any one thing. Um, so. um, but yet, the way Wagner first wrote his sketches, when he started writing actually the whole thing, at least large passages, is he wrote the, piano, the vocal line, written completely out, musically, with the words. And he wrote for piano, with two staves, um, a very rudimentary orchestral accompaniment. Even though, of course, as we know, certainly starting with the ring, the orchestra is hardly accompanied. And yet he wrote it as if it were. Um, very often just the bass line, with a few little indications, occasional indications of instruments. And um, it's quite amazing, because very often you really get no, at least I get no, Indication. I remember looking at the, 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 we don't have a lot of this. Wagner either destroyed it or it's still at Bayreuth and no one has access to it. The one work we do have a lot of is Tristan. And that's because Tristan never belonged to Cosima. Um, it eventually made its way back to Bayreuth. And for most of its history, it was, it was elsewhere. Um, and you have like, uh, I've seen the sketch of the first version, it's not a sketch, it's the first version of his oldest uh, narration in Act One. And um, you have all the words set to the music, very much like what appears in the, in the final score. And you have the bass line and a few rudimentary melodic elements from the orchestra. And occasionally you can see like an oboe or something, or trumpets, or something, little orchestral um, elements. Um, but really, it would be very hard to guess what it's going to sound like from that. Whether he knew and just didn't put it in, or whether he didn't know yet, we have no way of knowing. Then he went back through the whole piece and did it pretty much as a piano reduction. But not a piano reduction that you would play. It just looks on two stages. And sometimes there's a little bit of extra music and minus, but also very pianistically conceived. And this is interesting because Wagner was a, not a good pianist, and very much not a pianist. And he was arguably the very first composer in history who really conceived of the orchestra as an orchestra, not as any, just as, as orchestra colors, just as orchestra colors. I mean, it could be said, argued, that even Beethoven, Berlioz, Berlioz was the first composer who really conceived of the orchestra as orchestra. But Berlioz did not write piano scores first. And even when Wagner revised his way of composing, which was the third act of Siegfried, <clears throat> The prelude to Third Act Siegfried would have been very difficult to give any indication at all in this form. Even so, he still just expanded the piano thing. Instead of two stays, it'd be like four stays. Everybody know what a stave is? No. Okay. You know when you look at the, the, the music, and there's a clef, and there's five lines, and it's all those five lines, that's called a stave. Okay. You know what a clef means? The, the, the clef means key in, in French, and it's just the key to where middle C is. So the, the idea is that it, it, it establishes middle C for you. So if we have a, if a G clef, we call it, the, the treble clef says G is that second line, so that we, we can to tell where all the other notes are from it. So it's, it's like a key, you know, a map, a map legend. It says, you know, 
one inch equals 100 miles. Well, this means middle C is this place, or G is this place. It gives you some note to start, and everything else is related to it. So that's, see, these things are very easy. We bandy about these words, and they just need to be defined. It's not that. So, so Viper, to the very end of his life, composed everything on his piano. That piano was with him in Byron. So when he traveled, he traveled with his piano, which he very, um, I think, very poetically called his swan. I don't know why, but I feel very proud of him. That's right. It must have been quite interesting in some of the earlier trips. It was given the piano in 1853. And um, in the piano, although you can't see it in Trebship, there is a place where Wagner actually wrote in the piano the completion dates of all the works he completed on this piano, uh, which are Valkula, um, Tristan, Meister's Singers, and Philippe de Dameron and Parsifal, which is quite exciting. And I was the first person to play on this piano in the 20th century. And that's entirely serendipity. I played, you may have heard this story before, but it's such a wonderful story. It doesn't, I don't mind telling it again. I had played in Zurich and I had one free day where I go to Basel to play. And it had been raining for weeks, as it is wont to do in, in Switzerland. And it was a glorious day. It was one of these magical days. It was May 22nd, which of course is Wagner's birthday. So I said, instead of going straight to Basel, I'll do a triangle. I go down to Lucerne. I left my bags in the, uh, uh, the, the, the railway station and walked to Trebschen, Wagner's home, now a museum. And, um, I got there, there was a, uh, a truck in front of the front door. I said, oh, geez, it's closed on his birthday. But actually, the truck was delivering the piano. And as I walked to the door, the woman who runs the museum, who ran the museum, then Frau Capella, recognized me and was incredibly excited. Because she says, it's fake. You know, that we're just putting the, new, the piano. was just come back from being restored um, in Basel. It was a very famous old instrument restorer in Basel. And they were just actually putting the legs on, the pedals on. And I played. I sat down and started playing. Um, you might be interested to know what I played first on this piano, but that's it. Second act of Tristan. Second act of Tristan. First act of Tristan. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but, but I played also the quintet, and the music going into the quintet very early on. And while I was playing, I'd been playing for about 45 minutes, and I was really, really in an ecstatic state. I mean, it's very difficult to describe to you um, how I felt. This would have been in eight, 1987, 86, 87, 88, in that period. Um, uh, this woman came into the room like a meteor, and it was uh, Friedrich Wagner, whom I was had met. I was playing under that portrait of Wagner that's in the room there, Trisha, and she looked just like him. I mean, and she was she had come in from London because she to see the piano. Uh, um, she had not settled in Switzerland yet. She actually settled in Lucerne after that, and we became good friends. And uh, that was where I had lunch with her that day at a restaurant on Lake Lucerne. She said Toscanini used to take her when she was still hiding from, from, from Himmler and, and his crowd in um, 1938, 1939. And um, while we were having lunch, a, uh, David Shalom, an Israeli conductor whom I had worked with in Europe, came up and they spoke in, in Hebrew, which, uh, which astonished me that, that, that uh, Friedrich Wagner would speak Hebrew. And after he left, I said, Frau Wagner, how is it that you speak Hebrew? And she said that because a, a granddaughter of Richard Wagner should speak Hebrew which I thought was one of the classiest things I ever heard of. Um, anyway, um, that, that's my, that's, that's the high point of my Wagnerian life, right? <laughs> so Wagner composed at the piano. Um, and he composed, for, I know of almost no sketches extant of Wagner where um, uh, there's, we don't see words. And Wagner always said that as he wrote the words, he had what he called eine musikalische Luft, which really means a musical aroma in his head. So the assumption is, is that, except in the case of Tristan, in the case of Tristan, it's not that we have musical sketches of Tristan that I'm aware of, but that um, Wagner wrote repeatedly that Tristan existed only as music. Tristan began as music. And indeed, uh, Nietzsche's work, The Birth of Tragedy, Out of the Spirit of Music, is, is a direct reference to Tristan. That, that, work, that was the seminal work that inspired Nietzsche um, in, in, that, in that first work. And, and, and I agree with Simon that I think that Wagner, in spite of himself, was actually influenced by Nietzsche. Yeah. Um, definitely. And that was probably, and, and, and deep down, the irony is, is that we know that even though Nietzsche wrote these dreadful things about um, Wagner, that it's very clear also that he considered Wagner to be the greatest man he ever met. He said, I mean, in his last essay, that he considered himself lucky, that he uh, uniquely lucky that he lived at the same time as this uh, unique genius. And that, that he, um, but I think it's probably true also that Wagner recognized that Nietzsche was the most brilliant man he ever met. Um, and, and Nietzsche, of course, remained in love with Kosti. 
you know, his last letter before he became so insane that he could no longer write letters was this letter he wrote to Cosima and signed himself, you know, Richard. And it's an extraordinary letter, actually. Um, but he's imagining himself being, being not so much he was being Richard Wagner, but she was being Mrs. Friedrich Nietzsche, actually. <laughs> anyway, um, so I don't know if that answers some questions about Wagner's uh, compositional process. Well, yeah. As far as the autograph uh, orchestral scores, mm -hmm. the full score, mm -hmm. do they show uh, any revisions a la Beethoven, or are they clean like Mozart? They're pretty clean. I mean, I've only seen what the, the, the autograph scores of Meistersinger, that, that's a tribution, and the one on uh, Tristan, Juilliard Library has a copy. Um, um, the, the autograph score of Tristan is lost. No, the autograph score of Tristan is not lost. I don't know. The autograph scores of Rheingold, Valkyra, and the, the early operas are all lost. And, um, and since there is no actual complete edition of Wagner, there is no authoritative edition of Wagner. The closest would be the scores that they used in Bayreuth, which supposedly were, were put together from Wagner. But the mystery of what happened to the Rheingold and Valkyra scores, as well as the early opera scores, is one of the great mysteries. And actually, Sven Friedman, who is now the uh, president of, of the uh, tri of Von Fried and the, the, uh, the, the library and museum in Von Fried, uh, is convinced, uh, uh, Wolfgang Wagner was convinced that they were in Russia, in the Soviet Union, that they had been carried away from Berlin. They had presumably were hidden by them. Goebbels took them, arrested them from, um, um, the Wagner family uh, to protect them, supposedly, in Berlin. And, um, and presumably, the idea was that he hid them and that they were taken by the Soviets and are still sitting in the Soviet Union. And that was always the official line. Um, but Sven Friedrich is convinced there in the United States that somebody in Germany may cut a deal or, towards the end of the war and got them uh, secreted out in there in some private collection in the United States, uh, waiting, I don't know what, they could never sell them, of course. They belong, interestingly enough, um, now, because of a very arcane history, Wagner and his will left the, the scores to the ring to King Ludwig. They belong to King Ludwig. And the heir to King Ludwig is the state of Bavaria. And the state of Bavaria owns the Wagner Festival. So they belong to the Wagner Museum. In, in, in. So he has a right to be looking after them. This would be, of course, an enormous coup. By the way, um, there is the practical things missing because we don't have the score. For instance, in Rheingold, there is considerable amount of stage music, all those horns of Hunting. There's no music extent. You have no music. They just make it up. So there's just, and not all theaters do the same stuff. Uh, um, but it'll say, the stage directions say, horns heard in the distance. Well, we don't know what they're playing. Now, it's just kind of amusing. I mean, it's, also, there's a very famous mistake. In, in Rheingold, um, there was a place where the double bass parts have an extra note. And, and, and theater after theater, they just simply play with the uh, orchestra players, just play what's in front of them. And so, so there's like, two, goes on. So for like two or three measures, it's hideously not together. And you always just assume that they're not together. And it actually only came out that the mistake was there during the recording of the Schulte Ring, which was the first recording of Rheingold. Was in a recording, they were being so careful with details that they discovered there was this mistake. And as they went into it, they realized, no, the bass parts are wrong. And they said, well, let's check and see what they should be. Well, there's nothing to check with. Because there's no complete edition and there's no orchestral score. So, uh, no original score. Wagner's scores are, are, are beautiful. You can could, you could rewrite off of them. Um, he, the, the, so he did this piano, very short piano version. Then he did a fair copy piano version, which is no longer a piano version. Um, in other words, it's expanded. And then he did a full orchestration. And Wagner, the actual orchestration was completely separate from the composition. Um, and, and this is true of all of his works. All of his works, he completed the work and then did the company orchestration, which is sort of amazing for someone who's so orchestrally um, I was a professional conductor and thought so orchestrally. Um, the, the one little exception about the composition of Wagner's which I didn't really realize until recently, was Tristan. And this had to do with Wagner's need for money and his desire to promote performances of his works when he was still uh, in exile. Um, Tristan was published both, I mean, he finished the fair copy, finished the orchestration, and published the orchestration of each act separately. Act one of Tristan was published before he had started composing Act Two, theoretically. He obviously had started uh, composing Act Two, but it was, pub it was published as separate acts. I know of no other author in history that was done that way. And that was done strictly, he was trying to, to pr promote excitement with the work. Um, the transcription, this is a very interesting point, uh, Hans von Bülow made the piano transcription of the prelude of Tristan, 
at a time when, of course, he had never heard a note of Acts 2 and 3. Kind of an interesting, interesting to think of that. Uh, yeah. Talking about scores and transcriptions, I recall that a couple of years ago you mentioned that Bayreuth was rather tight-fisted when it came to access to the archives. Controlling, let's say, yeah. Is that still the case, or have they... I haven't, you know, them? first thing, um, I haven't done anything with the Bayreuth Library since 1976, and I made an inquiry to the Bay uh, Bayreuth Library in about 1984. My experiences in 76 and 84 were both, um, they were very tight-fisted, or very controlling. Um, I haven't had any direct access since. It might very much have changed in the last 10 years. There's been, first thing, since 1996, the legal situation changed, and then, of course, uh, then uh, Wolfgang died. Um, so it co could be quite different now. I um, found them quite a bit. Uh, I, I used the Muslim photo research a few years ago, mm -hmm. and, and what you always do in the German archives is you get to the director, and I'm going to talk to Sven Friedrich for like, sure. two hours, and suddenly there were lots of pictures there. Yeah, that's my feeling. I, I, that's what I wonder too. For instance, I went and had very specific questions. I, uh, my questions all had to do about, um, I think I mentioned this before, um, it, it all, had, all had to do with the 11 year interruption, 11 year hiatus in the composition of the ring. And, and the, the, my question was, how much of the post hiatus music had been composed or at least sketched before the hiatus. I find that to be an extremely interesting thing. Had he thought, this, we all know these many very famous uh, motifs only appear at after Actria and Siegfried, from Actria and Siegfried on. Now I'm just curious, had he already written them 11 years before? And so I, I knew that just to ask this question, like this, generally, you don't ask general questions to libraries and say, can I look around? Because what you can't. So I just had some, I had three very specific questions about material. And in two cases was, was it that had, hadn't been written before, and then the other was sort of the other way around. It was, it was um, um, had he made, yeah, it was the, sort of the same question, but, but it was a little bit different. It was three specific musical places. And um, I sat in the kitchen, that's where you used to sit to wait for the, to get the material. I made my application stuff, and I sat for two and a half hours, and the person came back and said there was no, there were, they, no, he didn't say even there was no information. He said, ich kann Ihnen nicht helfen, which just means I can't help you. This is what? So, say it again. I can't help you. <laughs> that was that. Um, um, but now I've become very good friends with, I went with Sven Friedrich, he had an official visit uh, having to do with his looking for the scores, although I, he didn't say that, to the um, Morgan Library. And he had called me and asked me to come with him as a translator, which he doesn't really need, but he, I came as a, as a German translator. And um, that was an amazing occasion. We had in our hands the first version of Goethe's Faust, the end of Goethe's Faust, which is to the Germans the absolute holy of holies of human achievement. And it doesn't, it's not in Germany, it's in, it's in New York City. As is, for instance, the, the manuscript with all the drawings of Le Petit Prince, of, of Exupéry, which is not in France, but which is at the Morgan Library. Mm -hmm. That really very sad story. That's because um, <clears throat> he left it with his girlfriend and had his girlfriend come to New York because he was, thought that she might get in the hands of, of the Gestapo. And since he was in the resistance, that they might use her. So he gave it to her to keep it safe. After the war, she was broke. And so she sold it. So anyway. Um, and of course, the, the French are trying to get it back, and um, we had, he, they have incredible things. They have a lot of Wagner as well, that's why ostensibly we were there. But now that I'm friends with Sven, I should try again, actually. Right? Because the, the, the fact is, of course, um, there are many things in, in there which have been destroyed or have been um, falsified. We know that. However, I doubt that any music would have been either destroyed or certainly not falsified. I think that probably. A lot of it is just simply that um, if there were sketches, Wagner himself may have destroyed a great many of them. Um, that was just 19th century practice. You know, um, composers like Stravinsky, who always had an eye for the buck, would have never destroyed sketches because he had said, thought of perhaps 30 years down the line he could sell them to somebody or have them sold and get money from them. But um, that, you know, that was not, they didn't think of things those ways at all in the 19th century. But I'm sure there are, I mean, it, it's, for instance, the fact that we have so much sketch material from Tristan, which is the one opera whose, whose um, material is not in, in, in Bayreuth, um, is, is, I think, significant. Which, well, now that we're on the subject, one other thing, which is, um, to me, um, I'm sure many of you have read the Haman 
uh, a biography of, of Winifred Wagner. Yeah, it's an excellent book, by the way. And very balanced. You know, you, you, I came out of the book with actually a feeling of her not as a monster, but as a, as a complex and in many ways very sympathetic and pitiable person. Um, but the stories about Vilant, especially the one about the scores of Parsifal and Tristan, the two great treasures that the Nazis had not been able to take away from, from Bayreuth were the scores of Tristan and Parsifal. And Vilant decided that he wanted to get out of Germany in 1945, the beginning of the, of the year. And so he and his uh, brother-in-law devised a plan where they were going to take them to Switzerland. And of course, if they had proposed this to anybody official, they would have been probably shot. I mean, theoretically, that was defeatist, just trying to leave was grounds for immediate execution, and taking out of Germany two you know, of the great treasures of German culture. And they got halfway across uh, Lake Constance to go into Switzerland, and they were stopped by Swiss border guards who made it very clear they would sink their ship if they continued. So they turned around. And so then they changed their mind. They decided they would go to Berlin and convince the Fuhrer that they should get permission to leave the country, to get some kind of documents to get them into Switzerland, to get this stuff out of the country. So they, in February of 1945, they drove to Berlin. Now, driving to Berlin from Bayreuth in 1940, February of 1945, the only way they could get, get um, um, yeah. gas was by taking furniture from houses and burning it, uh, using, using uh, it was, evidently it was an unbelievable uh, a voyage. It took them like three weeks to get to Berlin. And when they got there, of course, Hitler was, was already in the bunker. There was no way to see him. So they, they had to go back to Bayreuth. Actually, they didn't go back to Bayreuth. They went to Lake Constance. Um, um, so that, so um, Wilhelm Wagner, who knew he was in deep uh, doo-doo after the war was over, at this point, I think everybody knew which was what was going to happen, um, did not want to be in Bayreuth. So actually, Mama and, and, and Wolfgang were the two who were in Bayreuth when the soldiers came. Whereas Wieland and Lafrance and that whole crowd were down on Lake Constance, down in southern Germany, in very extreme southern Germany. <clears throat> OK. Any more questions about the compositional process? OK. So I'm going to talk, I want to do just a little bit more on the, 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 the motivic families, because there were a couple of things that I felt very strongly that I shortchanged you. Um, one thing I, 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 I really felt that I shortchanged was in talking about the motivic families, um, how music that is related to motifs can dominate whole long stretches of music. I mean, for instance, um, the, 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 you know, the ring motif. So we can hear, you know, you know, on and on, all this music based on this harmonic thing. And you, it's not exactly the ring motive, but it's music all of that world. And it can go, so it can, one of the big problems what, uh, that a composer who writes with something like light motifs has to think about is, is that the, you, it, if the music consists entirely of quotations of a light motive, each light motive in a way is a quotation. That's the idea. You're remembering something or you're thinking ahead to something. Um, you can't have a, a work of art which is only quotations. So um, uh, there are certain motifs that always occur as quotations. For instance, like uh, anytime we hear something like that, or 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 curse, these by their very nature are always like a quotation. You can always imagine them with quotation marks around them. But many other ones, the composer has a problem: what to do with the continuous music? You know, what to do with as it's just going on. Now, and the most common is, as if, if he has a sort of nature-sounding music, it's all of these arpeggios and things, so it in some way harkens back to the, the, the beginning of Das Rheingold and sort of the nature family. But he uses a lot of music in other ways. For, for one of my very favorite examples is, for instance, in the, in the, in the uh, this is for, not for Rheingold, as it happens for Valkyra, but it's an example of this. this. Uh, Zygmunt and Brunhilde are getting more and more passionate in their, uh, are, in their, I don't know, argument is the wrong word, but their discussion. Um, and um, there's this beautiful melodic line going on, this, 
which is an extension, just a melodic extension of, 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 of a motif that has just been introduced in this theme. Um, but all this other stuff, which keeps it going, all this... going and builds up the excitement and, and, and gives it sort of a, a musical framework to have the melody on is, is combinations of two basic motives ideas that are being constantly um, um, developed. And that's a musical term. That's actually a technical term for musicians. Develop means that you take a musical idea and you work with it. You, you change it. You, you repeat it. You do it upside down. You, you just keep on you're doing with it. And the two ideas here are basically scales which we associate with Wotan Spear, and this, which of course is the same, the Praia, which is this, this love motive kernel. So we have this struggle going on between Wotan Spear, power, the world of power, and the love motive, which is the world of love. Isn't that exactly what's happening in the scene? So the orchestral accompaniment of the scene, underneath the melodic line, is basically a metaphor, constantly working out metaphor, of the struggle which is happening in the scene. So this is a wonderful example. This, this is one of the best examples, but this kind of thing is happening all, all the time in the ring. And it's the kind of thing that really uh, um, justifies and, and uh, Father's whole premise, the whole compositional premise in the ring. And it's also, and this is I think an important point, it's one of the ways in which the music of the ring is different from the music of the other late operas. It's other than, certainly different than um, Tristan and Meistersinger, Parsifal occasionally has things a little like this, where the actual, just ongoing musical texture seems to take on uh, metaphoric or symbolic um, meaning. And, and, and again, um, I should repeat, it's not that we're supposed to be thinking about this. Although now that I've said it, you will. But I, I, Wagner as a composer and as an artist believes that peripherally, subliminally, these things will nevertheless affect us. We are aware of them even if we're not aware of them. And now that you are aware of them, you'll always be aware of them. Um, so I, that's one thing I want to talk about, the use of these motive family sort of generally as, as, as constant accompaniments of the music is sort of what keeps the, the musical thread going. Um, this is a very, very important thing to say, which I'm sure you, you probably know but haven't thought about, is, is that, of course, light motifs in a way have ex had existed in operas long before Wagner and are used also, for instance, by Verdi. In, in, in Arnie and Traviata, and certainly in Aida, and, and in several of the operas, and done by many composers, insofar as there are themes attached to characters, if nothing else. Um, but there is a very, and, and that's, there are themes in Lohengrin, there is the, the, the you know, the theme, for instance, which is always quoted as an early uh, light motif. Um, you should never ask me the question. But the difference between the music in the ring and in these cases is, is that in these cases, these motivic ideas, these associated phrases, stand out from the rest of the music. They are quotations, but they are separate things. You might go 15 or 20 minutes without hearing one, and then the character comes on stage and you hear it, and then it goes away again. Like Amneris has a thing in Aida, and anytime she walks on stage, you hear it first, but that's not what she sings, that's not the rest of her music. It doesn't come up in ensembles or other things, it's just sort of a intro music kind of thing. Whereas in the ring, the concept is it's all motivic. There is no music in the ring, in theory. There perhaps is some music, but in Rheingold still there are a few places that are more or less dry recitative. By the time you get to Gitter Demeron, um, there really is nothing. It's, it's, we, because there's so much, this web of associations and, and what we remember and, and it's so incredibly complex and so multi-layered, and Wagner has done this very much on purpose, that all the music, there's no, no longer any, this is very important actually from a music history standpoint, no longer any distinction between exposition and development. Exposition in a musical term is when I'm giving you the material, and development is when I'm changing it, working with it, undergoing it. That's one of the basic divisions. And what happens in music in the 20th century, in the late 19th century, especially with Debussy, who was a great Wagnerian, in spite of himself, um, is that, that the distinction between exposition and development disappears. That, that music is developing, the, the material is developing all the time. You're sort of, you're, it's, there's no longer a saying, here is the material and here we're working it out. You can, you can no longer separate that. It's all, all the time, motives, all the time being worked out. Okay, and then, um, I'd like also now um, to talk about 
one family that I didn't mention, which is more than a family because it's such a basic element of music, but which Wagner exploits extremely um, dramatically and all the way through the ring. And that's just two notes, and they're next to each other. The difference between and this is called a minor second. This is called a major second. Second because they're it's just one, two. It's two notes, so it's second. Um, away. Now, um, the, the minor second, the very first time that we hear in a, I mean, obviously, it's such a basic musical thing, you hear it all the time, but the first time that we really hear it all in the ring is a very important spot. It's when Albert has been refused, oh, it's going to be cut out of this music, not to play my memory. Um, it's been, when Albert has been refused by the, the third, the last of the, of the Rhine Mains, and he goes, means woe in German, and it's which is um, also very significant. It's, um, first entrance of my, well, no, not the first, the second entrance of, of my little love cell. Um, anyway, so it's, and this is, this minor, predominant minor second, we hear all over the ring in lots of different ways. Um, we hear it, for instance, when Albrecht kisses the ring, we hear it as He's harmonized it. By the way, where does that come from? Anybody can tell me that sort of harkens from? From the, 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 the forging, the, the, which is associated with the, with the Nibelungs in general. So he takes a little bit of that. Are, that's the place where he kisses the ring and there's this, they all scream or they all come running or whatever. And there's always very dramatic in the orchestra, the, the, the cymbals play, suspended cymbals play, and it makes that big sort of roar sound that they, the cymbals can do, which is not a common sound in, in Wagner, and so it makes a big impression. And for instance, the same idea, we hear all dressed up in completely different harmonies in Gooder Demer, um, many times in Act One and in Act Two. Wagner in, in 1853, when he wrote Rheingold, didn't write those kind of harmonies. That's, that's something that happens after Tristan. Um, but the idea is the same. This, the connection between these two places, by the way, Wagner, in the only example I know of of his doing any analysis of the music himself, it writes in an open letter to the, the Bayreuther Blätter, the Bayreuth newsletter. Um, he points this out. Um, he points this out, by the way, he says, instead of trying to find all the motifs, it might be more interesting to see how motivic ideas change through the works, which, of course, is what I'm trying to do. So we're, but even this is a perfect example of the, the, this play through the ring between this minor second, which is woe. It's just because it lends itself to that. And the major second, the major second, of course, is, I guess, it. With that sort of, we think Rhine, that's such a, a major occurrence in the ring. When we first hear them sing Rhine Gold, Rhine Gold, Leuchten des Gold, that's, that makes a huge impression on us. And we hear it that way all the time. Like when Siegfried comes out of the cave. You notice it also goes. So, so in a way, he has anticipated the Nibelung's, um, you know, forging rhythm, which we hear, of course, so much, um, with the ambles by themselves, already before when the Rhine Maidens have sung their song. So there's just, there's just like this dichotomy between Rhine Gold, Rhine Gold, and... These two things, 
and, and, and sort of opposing kinds of forces. And the, 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 the possibilities of putting these in the music are just infinite. For instance, uh, one that you may not have noticed is in this passage I played last night. Um, even at the very end of the ring, this is somewhat a radical interpretation when you have that. The orchestra goes. Hmm. So you could say that's a last sort of resolution of, of, of that same idea. And the thing that, because it's such a basic musical idea, the contrast between... And he goes back and forth all the time. He, and there are many places in Rheingold where he'll go, uh, a very famous one right before, right here. Again, the page is torn out. No, right here. It's, it's, here. Um, it's, it's the, the, the interlude, the orchestra between it going back up from the line. And a lot of this is based on the a theme I forgot to talk about yesterday, which is another one of these um, harmonized version of the um, of the nature of the of the basic arpeggio. The golden apples, of course, which is, makes sense. It's part of nature. It's a manifestation of nature. So we, we're hearing that. this conflict between the two. And this goes all the way through the ring. It becomes more and more harmonically um, pungent in the later operas, especially in Gutter but the idea is, is, is all the way through the ring. So this is another way, I mean, it's hard to say whether these are exactly light motifs or not. I mean, they're such basic musical elements. I mean, I think most tables would say this is, well, this is a light motif in a very strictly Because every time we hear it, we think of the Rhine Maidens and their call. Even if, for instance, it doesn't have to have anything whatsoever to do with the Rhine Maidens at all. Um, when Siegfried is getting ready to go through the fire, this is one of my absolutely favorite parts. People say, what's your favorite music in the ring? This would be very close to it. When he's going. That's Rhine Gold. I mean, the forest bird is there, that part. And Siegfried motive is there. They make sense. He's following the forest bird to go forward. Why? Because we associate it with the Rhine Maidens, but we associate it with joy. And the kind of joy the Rhine Maidens are showing, which is this joy of being alive, the, 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 uh, the, the, that kind of happiness which he's manifesting. So it's gone from something very specific to something very general, uh, um, which is a very typical um, a, a trait of the, of the most important motifs, that when we first hear them, they'll have a very specific meaning. And then as, as they become used throughout the, the, the cycle, their meaning becomes more and more symbolic and more and more uh, um, general. Okay, I just wanted, I did want to do that before. Okay, now I'm going to spend, how, what, half an hour? Well, 30? 45 minutes. 45 minutes, great. So, in, instead of having question and answers that you study, I'm going to give you questions and have you answer them. <laughs> Hopefully. So, I expect somebody to give me answers, but I'm just going to stand up here. Um, the first one, and some of these are questions that I asked you years ago. So, the first question is a very simple one, but I think a very interesting one. This is if Votan is king of the gods. Um, he has the spear. He theoretically seems to have a lot of power. Why does he want to have the hollow belt? And this part two of the question is, um, why does he get somebody else to build it for? Why, why get giants the hollow? Why get, well, he doesn't call it the hollow yet, so it's not, the hollow name comes later. At this point it's Gutterborg, it's just the god's house. Why does he want to have a palace built, and why does he hire somebody else to build it for him? Isn't it Fricka want the palace so uh, to, to make her happy? He says that, yes. That's part of it, certainly. <laughs> Can you hear her answer? I just want to make sure we hear the answers. Um, her answer was Fricka. Fricka wants it. She wants a house because she thinks if he has a nice house, that Wagner, that Wagner, that, that Botan would stay home <laughs> uh, and, and, and not be running around all the time. And, uh, and, I, and my answer to that is that Bob, he says that, but I don't think that's all true. Do you want a conscious reason or an unconscious? Both. 
Now, the unconscious, he's actually profoundly uncertain of his power. Yes. And, he's, and, 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 and he lives in that terrible uncertainty that Wagner would describe it. Exactly. I think that's a very important that, that, the, the most important part of the answer as to why he wants to build the palace is that it's a very important sign, a very important thing, that Wotan is not at peace. He feels threatened, he feels insecure, he feels unsure of himself. Yeah. I mean, in that note, uh, he wants, uh, it, later on, where that's where the heroes are but, but That's not a great idea. Well, let's, let's hold off on that. I'm going to talk about that in a second. That's not, I'm talking now, as the curtain rises on, on well, at least on scene two, um, the vote time we first see why he has had this palace built. But now, what about the second one? Is point? it a palace or a fortress? Well, when it's fortress. It's fortress. It's fortress. fortress. Yeah. fortress. Yeah. But play, they're going to live there, so, okay. Yeah, but also the protected. Yeah, I, I guess because I spent so much time in Italy, in the, in the Middle Ages, there was no, no distinction between a palace and a fortress. The, the fortresses were palaces and vice versa, but that's a, that's a good point. But why does he get someone else to build it? Uh, I mean, surely, between him and the daughter and these guys, they could have managed to build it themselves. Why have somebody, why contract somebody else to build this palace for? He says he wants to tame the giant. Exactly. What does that mean? He wants to have a relationship with them where he controls them. Right. And I, I, I think that's the whole, that's the whole key to the answer. Uh, did, did you prompt her? Or? No, no, no. No, no, no. no, 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 no. no um, um, I think it's very important because it also shows the way Votan operates. I mean, I have no real reason to think that Votan couldn't have built his own fort if he wanted to, really. But Votan controls the world by contracts, by making deals with people. Now, uh, obviously, he doesn't, he, he knows that his power is dependent upon these contracts. We see that already very clearly. After all, the, um, well, I'll ask another question later, but we know that he takes them very seriously, his contracts. Um, um, and indeed, and indeed, if we look, one of the things that actually was said, but if we look very carefully at Basraigal, Votan actually doesn't break his contract with anybody. Um, he does some terrible things, but he doesn't break his contract. He, the, the, the giants agree to a different payment. And when push finally comes to shove, when he's not going to give that full payment, in other words, the ring is part of the payment, they're going to take Freya away. And Freya only is free when he gives up the payment. So Votan does not renege on his, on his bargain. We actually never see Votan, that I can remember any time of the ring, really renege on any of his bargains. Um, he may want to or change them, yes? Where did this whole business with the contracts written on the staff begin? Well, that's... It be, that's also a very good question, and this is a question that I wish we had Herr Wagner here to ask. Wagner wants us to have that idea that Wotan rules the world uh, with contracts which are guaranteed by the runes on the spear. I don't think that the actual runes write out the contracts, but the runes contain sort of this holy magic stuff, and holy, that's the word he uses for them, um, in that they guarantee, they're sort of the guarantors, and they, they imbue the spear with this power that he can control people with, but which is dependent on his ability to, uh, uh, to live up by his own, own contracts. And this, of course, came when he made the spear. Because we, hear, we, only, we only learn this in the prelude of, of Gooder Demmer. Now, it is true that the very first thing that Wagner wrote when he started writing the Ring, what was to become the Ring, was the Norn scene. The very first thing. The earliest music we have in the Ring is the Norn scene. The earliest sketch of the Ring is the the, the, the Norns ask each other questions. They do it to this music, which is in the same key. That it still is. They go. And then all three together. That's, that's the first music I know of chronologically written for the Red. So initially, the Norns were going to sing in a very slow version what became the Ride of the Valkyries. Uh, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It shows you some interesting uh, ways to compare the, the, the Norns with the Valkyries, too. Um, so anyway, in Wagner's initial conception, the, the very first thing we were going to hear about was how Wotan made his spear. And yet, when he wrote the ring, rewrote the whole story, and rewrote it or whatever, he did not choose to put that um, in Rhinegold in any way. I mean, he could have had two first scenes of Rhinegold, two sort of Urzen, you know, scenes that are the basic background. One of them could have been uh, Votan's uh, uh, 
killing the world astro. He kills the world astro. When he does that, it dies. And the light goes out. The, the light doesn't go out. The fountain stops. The water stops running. That's the Norns tell us this. This is way back in some prehistoric day. This is way back. Much further back even than the Rape of the Rhino, uh, which is back, but not that far. It could, it could be actually just, just a few years back, I guess. Depends on how fast he can accumulate this, this, this treasure. Um, but with the ring, presumably he could do it very quickly. Um, but why Wagner doesn't want to, I have ideas, but I don't know. I, mean, I think that he wants us to make the parallel between Wotan and Alberich, but perhaps he wants that parallel not to be too uh, literal and direct. Because just think how literal it would have been if there would have been this early first scene of, of Wotan, of, uh, of the Norns talking about Wotan's uh, destroying the, the, uh, the world astro to make his spear. And then the, um, Alberich going down to the Rhine and, and stealing the Rhine. It would have been an awfully strong parallel. I'm also very glad he didn't because, and I think this is the real reason why he didn't. If you think about it, there are, there's an enormous difference between the Rhine Maiden scene that opens Rheingold and the Norn scene that opens Gunnar Dammer. All they have, they both contain material which is the foundational of the deep past of the story of the ring. Um, the, the, there's almost no memory in the Rhine Maiden scene that begins Rheingold. Um, yes, there is some memory. Can anybody tell me what memory there is by what, that there is a past to that scene? Can anybody tell me? For instance, they say over and over, Daddy warned us about this guy. Daddy warned us not to, to, to guard the ring. To, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, they have some past, both with, with Albert, maybe not as a person, but with Nibel, and, and the fact that their dad has warned them, their dad presumably is the father of Ryan, to, to guard this precious rival. Um, and, and we have even a little bit of past insofar as that we see a relationship between the sisters. That Flosilda, the contralto, is sort of the wise, prudent sister. Although, ironically, she's the one who's the most audacious in her flirtation with Alberich. Um, anyway, the, uh, but basically, the Rhine Maiden scene is, is, is all on exposition. It has very little remembrance. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Whereas the, the Nord scene is all remembrance. All remembrance and prophecy. It doesn't really exist on any other level except remembrance and prophecy. And the whole premise of Wagner's music in the ring is that both prophecy and, and remembrance are the, the realm of the light motif. That's the purpose of the light motif. So you need to have this enormous body of music upon which you can build to have remembrance and prophecy. So actually, he needed to have the Nord scene very late in the ring in order to have all this music already presented. Yeah, he actually needs it for another reason. Mm -hmm. Is that Siegfried, on the whole, of the sort of the big operas is the one that moves most forward. I mean, people do have memories, but one of the things is that actually Siegfried doesn't have a memory. That Siegfried is constantly going forward. And when we get to go to Demerin, which where where memory of the past is very very important, the first thing we hear is it's the memory of the deep past. The, the, the deep past. So it sets us up yeah. to really sort of realize to think of the whole span of time. That's and right. it's very crucial that he leaves that piece of Yeah, and, and, and it's very interesting that he does, but yes. it's very crucial. So but we, so we, now it's true, I mean, I think that Derek Cook's point, um, which he makes repeatedly in, in I Saw the World End, is certainly true. That Wagner grew up on these Norse mythological stories, and he would almost assume that just as we all know, or more or less know, that, it, that Achilles was killed by an arrow because his mother hadn't protected his heel, or all these very, you know, things from the Trojan that the Trojan War was caused because Helen was seduced from, her, from um, uh, the, the younger brother of the king of the Greeks, Menelaus, to, uh, to, to, to go to Troy because Paris, and, and because of the judgment of Paris, he was, she, he was given this power by, because he chose uh, um, Aphrodite, and these things which, which anybody, because we more or less, many of us do know Greek mythology, but most of us in our world don't know about Votan's spear. But Wagner assumed that his audience would, I think, to some extent. So I think that Wagner probably assumed that his audience knew about Wotan's spear and its holy runes and the treaties that it guaranteed. Um, but we certainly see it right in action, I mean, right off the bat, the Wotan. It, I don't even think it would have occurred to Wotan to build his own fortress. To get somebody else to build it so that they're, they're caught up in his, um, uh, um, in his laws. They're, they're beholden to him. Here's a, um, a, a question that sort of relates to something we were just talking about, kind of, with the Rhine Maidens. And this is more of a subjective question. To what extent are the Rhine Maidens guilty? Um, 
I mean, is their teasing malicious or innocent? Um, to what extent are they guilty? I mean, you think? I think malicious. Mm -hmm. And in this production that we watched yesterday made the, uh, the most unpleasant. Children, yeah. And I've ever seen them. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that, the, that um, this, this question I'm asking was provoked a little bit by this production because I question that. Um, I, I question um, the degree of their malice. I, I, I question the, I, I should put this differently. I question how much a Wagner intended the degree of their malice. Mm -hmm. This is a rather unfortunate thing for us today. They say something very important after they've teased him, and they're very mean about teasing him. Let's face it, that, that, I'm not defending their teasing him, although it doesn't have to be quite as egregious as it was in this one. But they are egregious. I mean, there's no question, just the words are egregious. And we ironically hear the very first shadow of what's going to be the Ford or Love Cell when the, when Flossil, the third one, is sort of, you know, uh, uh, wrinkling all over him or whatever she's doing. Um, but then they sing this very kind of jolly song. Uh, um, you know, cheer up, Albert. Go find a girl of your own type. You know, in other words, their big thing is you're not appropriate for us. You're an inappropriate love thing for us. Your, your attempts at love are, are inappropriate and, uh, um, you, go, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're saying go find your own, go find somebody from your own world to have fun with. I think they're the guardians, they're actually, they're supposed to be the guardians of the goal. The secret, the secret is they were certainly foolish to give it up, and the reason they do give it up, what is, why do they go ahead, even when Flossilda says, don't tell that, they go ahead and say that he who renounces love curses love. Uh, they're, they're definitely careless, but there's a very specific reason why. Because they don't think he will ever That's right, because he, all that, he, seems so, he seems so full of love. And, and, and that, I think, is, is to me much more significant aspect of the Ryan Maiden scene than, than their uh, being, excuse the expression, cock teasers, uh, uh, which to some extent they are. But I think their culpability is in that they perhaps don't recognize something very important, which is that love as it is seen, and this is going to be the subject of my talk, one of my talks about Cure, both from a musical standpoint, that love as we see it in this scene, indeed, as we see it all through. Um, um, uh, rival is a very imperfect and incomplete vision of love as far as Wagner is concerned. And the, the Rhymings have confused Alberich's uh, uh, attempts to seduce them with love. And, and I think that Wagner does not think it's really love. And, and so when the, it is not that difficult for Alberich to renounce love. They think this guy will never renounce love. He's in love with us. But he's not in love with them. He's just forced. Or he's just, um, perhaps a better word is that he wants to possess them because they embody this beauty that he doesn't have, which probably is a much better way. But he, the idea that Wagner thinks about love, which has to do with a lot of issues of, of empathy and compassion and fellow feeling and all sorts of things, and the, the good of the other person and these kind of things, there's absolutely zilch of that. Albert doesn't give a damn about any of those things with him. And so they have misunderstood love. And so it is no big deal if Albrecht Ziegler, for instance, could never have renounced love. Uh, but Albrecht can. It's no big deal for Albrecht. Indeed, maybe that's the whole point of, of when he pulls out the sword. Is the, we, we, both operas start with the first scene that has two people faced with a situation. One very easily renounces love because he doesn't really understand what it is in the first place. The other absolutely will not renounce love because love is everything to him. Yeah, that's, yes? Yeah, just, I mean, let me interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Flossil actually said, uh, our father told us the maidest guardians, faithful guardians of all the gold, lest some rogue should before the deep waters on guard, then possibly guard. That's the same. Yes, yeah, right. Well, that's a good thing. Yes, you got to Are they Ryan Maidens or Ryan Daughters? Ryan Daughters. I'm completely wrong. I'm totally, entirely wrong. That's just one of these silly and, and very uh, incorrect uh, uh, things that we call them, they should always be called Ryan daughters, not Ryan maidens. There's no indication that they're maidens or anything like that. They're Ryan daughters. Yeah? I think that they also, it's mentioned by your book, Hunter that, Wright, that they seduce men. I think they represent a certain aspect of love. Sirens, yeah. And whereas, whereas, yes, whereas his wife represents stable married love. So mm -hmm. they're just a certain embodiment. Yeah, love. that's true. I, I always have wondered whether. Um, that uh, Cricket might be engaging a little special pleading at that moment. She, it's very convenient for her to dismiss the, the Rhine daughters, certainly. But yes, that's a good point. Yes? Yeah, that, uh, another thing that the director did by making um, Albert drunk, it also 
WrestleMania more important and more uh, yeah. right. and less interested in, in anything and they sure. become weaker. Right. I thought that was a, a particularly infelicitous idea because um, any, any lingering sense of tragedy in his renouncing of love was certainly mitigated by the fact that he's clearly too drunk to do it anyway. Uh, um, which was kind of the point, wasn't it? Uh, so I don't know. I, I felt that that wasn't convincing. Yes? What, what Albert was really feeling was lust. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he didn't really renounce lust. He just transferred it to the gold. That's right. Absolutely right. That's exactly the point. women gold. Yes. That's, that's, that's just exactly the point. And, that's, and, and I think that it's very important for us to recognize that the Rhinemaids make a very good mistake there. They really misunderstand Albrecht and or the nature of love itself. Now that's that's another question. Yes. Yeah. Also, Albrecht fooled them by being so nimble to get up to the top. Yes, that's true too. That's sort of a more physical yeah. thing. That depends upon the production, of course. But um, yes, they don't think he can actually get up there as it happens. But yeah. It seems to me uh, this tendency sometimes to see the Rhinemaids as as guilty reflects a modern sensibility of of increased empathy for the disabled, the disfigured, et cetera. Um, yeah. And we think they're taking advantage of Alfred, whereas their view, as I think you indicated, is that he really is a different order of being. It's not that he's somehow uh, an inferior or ugly. He's simply, he's simply different. Yeah. And the irony, which I guess is yet another element of the comic uh, in, in Simon's definition of this as a satire, is that while on the one hand they view him as a different order of being, on the other hand they view him as having the same reluctance to renounce love of everyone yes. else, which is a, a you know a fundamental contradiction and a mistake. Yeah. Which but, is pain. The comic thing, yeah. the comic thing, for instance, that scene should be extremely common. When he's when he starts to sneeze because he's underwater and trying to go in the water, and he says, for fluke the sneezing and all this kind of thing, and there and then she says she, and she says, my, my, my lover is coming to me sneezing yeah. or, 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 or sniffling, she said. I mean this is actually should be funny. It wasn't done that way. But, but it should be, it could be. In other words, that's a very typical aspect of Rhino. But this is a deadly serious thing. The whole ramifications of this scene are in the rest of the ring, in a way. And yet, in a way, it's also a very funny scene. Um, the, the theme, by the way, of inappropriate love, I think that Albert has no concept whatsoever of what love is. And there's no indication that he ever has or ever would have had. But um, nevertheless, um, inappropriate love is a very important theme in another work of Wagner's. What do you want to say what it is? You talked about it, Sam. Meister's here. Meister's here. Meister's here. Um, because that's the problem of Bettmesser. The problem of Bettmesser is not that his song is bad necessarily, although it is bad, um, but it's not really that bad. But that Bettmesser is an entirely inappropriate lover, as is Hans Ox for, for Ava. Uh, of course, this is in a much more realistic setting. But still, I think that. Um, no. I, I think that the, there is, in the modernist tendencies, when we, when we do the ring, um, in our attempt, you know, I think that, uh, I'm going to give my little two cents on it, sort of a major subject, which is that I think that poor Wagner suffers from his enormous success. And if someone were to say to me, I know nothing about dramaturgy and staging and blocking and things, that what is Wagner's greatest triumph as a drama, not as a dramatist, but as a dramatic writer? I would say is his ability to give real depth and complexity to almost all of his characters, including his villains. That his villains are absolutely as deep, fleshed out, complex, sympathetic as his heroes, um, occasionally more so. And that really the only work of Wagner that I feel that that's this, there is none of this is, is Lohengrin. And in Lohengrin, even in Lohengrin, Tellerman certainly has this. And, Perhaps Orchard, no, Orchard really doesn't. I mean, um, Wagner doesn't have the stick villains, the, the non-motivated people. I mean, in Wagner, if people do good things, we know why they're doing them. If they do bad things, we know why they're doing them. It's very important for Wagner that we see where people are coming from. One of the purposes of the first scene of Rhinewald is that we see where Alberic is coming from. And, um, um, but he then suffers because um, people <coughs> confuse the fact that, that Hagen, for instance, or that Alberic is are, are, are real people with real feelings, with real disappointments, with real frustrations that are pitiable in many respects, but they nevertheless can be extremely evil. I mean, uh, uh, we, because we can sympathize with poor Albrecht, we say poor Albrecht, and, and Albrecht's plight and everything, and yet if we just simply look at what he says to Votan and Loga in scene three, it would be hard 
even if we try to set down a more truth, truly evil vision of, of, of the world, then, then he has as his dream, his plan, in scene three of, of, of the Bible. So, you know, we, we um, in, in our, in Wagner's success in creating such a well fleshed out and complex villain is Alberich. Or even hunting, for God's sake, is fleshed out. That is essential for any villain. I mean, one thinks the most famous villain of all is Iago. Is the most hateful person I've ever, uh, ever seen created in drama, and yet we have to completely understand him mm -hmm. and find out where he is, because it's only then that we understand the, 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 the real force of the evil. Sure, and, and this is the weakness of somebody else. Nothing there that's just been developed magic vision, and we just go piss, and that's it. Yeah, and that's exactly the problem yeah. of, of most operas on that level. Yes, we have no sense of why the overwhelming majority of operatic villains are bad. They're just bad. They're just bad. They have a black hat on them. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did Alberich bother Oh, he, he tells us this very specifically. He bought a woman. He, uh, for, I guess, decided he needed an heir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He must have bought her with a lot of money. He obviously still had money left over. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he, we didn't even know her name. Was it Grimhill, I guess, or something? I yes. forgot her name. I think Grimhill sticks to me. But um, yeah, he bought her. She was obviously uh, uh, someone who went, then later on and married the king of the Gibbons, Gibbage. And um, so he was, that's why he's the half brother. Was he the oldest of the Yeah, he's older brothers. He's older than, than Gunther and Gunther. And, and one of the, the great bitterness, which we're anticipating next year a little bit, but what Votan says, you know, although I think Votan is, is, is not entirely correct in his assessment, he says, I, who have loved so deeply, cannot have a. Uh, I have to kill my own son, and Albert, who only hates and has no love at all, just bought a woman, um, um, has um, his son will take over the world. Right when he's getting ready, in his bitter irony, to bequeath the world to Hagen's son. I mean, to Albert's son, he specifically says, you know, that Nibelung and Zoll, Zoll, and there's a quotation at the end of Hagen's watch, he, he calls himself Nibelung and Zoll to the same music. So, in a way, Hagen is quoting uh, the Votan. Uh, sort of nightmarish vision in, 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 uh, in the, it's sort of the, the, the bleakest uh, moment uh, in, the, in the monologue. Um, anyway, I think that, I think that um, one of the issues, and I think that this is probably what I'm going to talk largely about in musical terms in Valkyra, is um, love as an issue of the ring is extremely complex and extremely central. And I would agree that love versus power is probably the central conflict of the ring. But love versus love, different types of love and different um, and different ways of thinking about love is also a major problem. Um, just something to think about as we go into the future. Think about the fact that how often love in the ring actually becomes a negative force. Uh, uh, or at least what people define as love. It's a negative force right here in the first scene and then the Ryan may misunderstand Albert. They should have never told Albert about cursing love. Uh, that's, that seems quite simple. But very often I think in the course of the ring, uh, people um, uh, because of being in love, or because of how they understand love, make some very egregious mistakes. A question: How do you, how do you read Botan's love? Who does Botan love? Well, that's how does Botan love. Well, I think we should talk about that when we get to the Valkyrie. Certainly, in Rheingold, in the world of Rheingold, we can talk about Rheingold for now. Um, everything that we see defined as love is a very limited view of it. Very limited. Um, um, what? Okay, we have Alberich, who the right thing think is in love with him, who obviously is not. Um, uh, so the, both of them have a very limited view of love. If that's how they see love, if somebody chases them around trying to, to seduce them or rape them, basically, uh, um, it's, it's a pretty limited view of love. What about the giants? Now, Abazel is always thought of as being the one character in Rhyme who truly manifests love. And he certainly is, is, is obsessed with, with Freya. But I wonder how seriously we should take that, too. It I mean, is, it is compassion. There's a strong element of compassion. Actually, in some productions, there is an element there in Fassel that he actually there is a sort of a compassionate love for, and not only a uh, Perhaps. Okay. And but some it, interpretations, some productions, you actually see that Friar responds. Yes, sure. Oh, no, no, no. The no, 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 Frank Lepage. Yes. Yes. I have yes. to say, in Lepage, the pod, um, and one thing is a very interesting point, and in, in, I'm just going to do a question, but I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to ask any more questions. Um, was had to do with the, the ring, the manifestations of the power of the ring in Rheingold. And uh, one of the ways that we, we certainly see in Rheingold that every character who hears about the ring, um, with, with two exceptions, um, is immediately under its spell. 
this, this is even before this would occur. Um, and, um, and the one character, Fazl, is only partially under its spell. It says he unwillingly agrees. Very interesting place. This, where this is one of the chaos. It says he unwillingly shows that he's agreed with his brother Fazl that it would be better to have the gold than to have fry. Uh, by the way, that was one place that the conductor did rather well. There you go. See, I feel I have to give the devil his due. Um, um, but I, um, there is one character, of course, this is something that uh, uh, Derek Cook makes a very large deal about. There's one character who absolutely seems totally uninterested in the ring at all. No, Loka is very interested in the ring. He's not interested in having the ring. He understands absolutely this is how the ring is. Right. 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 And only a ring. Fry. Fry is totally, I mean, she doesn't respond. She can't. She can't. That's the point. She, she can't. can't. She yeah. can't. Yeah. When she stands for love, she stands for, love. She stands for sort of love as a, as a manifestation of nature. Love as spring. Yes. Love and spring is twins, which is, we're going to hear all about that in Act 1 of Gulf here, aren't we? Um, um, and, and that's who she is, and that her music will dominate that scene. Her love music will dominate all of Zygmunt and Zygmunt's love music, which really is love in the spring. Um, and and um, so she actually does it, but everybody else in one, and of course I, I've always felt, and you've said this before, but it's worth saying is, I find it fantastic, and even in this production we got a little of that. And this is something else that Lepage does relatively well, is showing how the ring fascinates everybody at a different level. How for, for Fricka, who I think is still very deeply in love with Wotan, uh, um, although Wagner perhaps sees it as a jealous, possessive love, not as a compassionate, free, open love, you're not convinced of that. And I think it's a much deeper love than that. I mean, it, in fact, her, uh, she's the one who first introduced that wonderful long melody. Precisely. That, that's going to be the sort of topic. It's key. key. That key. key. Absolutely key. It's key. Fry, Fry, Fricka, you know, um, the music doesn't lie, right? The music can be ironic, but the music never lies. And Fricka is given absolutely the most important love music in the ring is first associated with Fricka. I'll say that. Just um, um, so that, that in itself is highly significant. It can't be, you know, you can't just dismiss it. It has to be, it, maybe you could talk it out, you could argue it away in some way, but it still is, is, is true. Can you say an in-line Yeah, sure. Well, there's two things, <clears throat> two things. The, the one I'm talking about, well, I'll do the one, the first thing that, um, um, both pretty subtle, um, well, especially so. You know what, I'm not going to have any of the music here. It's going to be torn out. I'll play it by memory. <laughs> no, because it has to do with the love mode. Anything having to do with the love mode is going to be gone. What happened to it? It's in my dissertation. Oh. <laughs> what she's saying is... I, mean, I want to get the exact note. She says these notes. Oh, here it is. I do have it. In the family he fought. For my husband's, this is a horrible translation, in order to, to look after my husband's faithfulness, I sadly must wonder what I can do to keep him from wandering away. She's talking about how can I keep my husband? We hear. Anybody recognize that? It's like the heart of the love music of Zygmunt and Siglinda. Right. Um, and it's, it's, this is a, a great example of this anum I talked about, this presentiment or foreshadowing. It doesn't mean anything to us here except it's mighty pretty. And, and, and not only mighty pretty, it's, it's totally different from any of the music around it. It comes, I was very struck by that yesterday, I think you were too. I mean, it just sounds so different from anything else. All of a sudden you have this, the tremolos, the orchestra. And, You know, it's very and and the the other one that we're talking about is this. Well, here it's not as not as clear. I'll play it another time. That thing, which is the 
theme that will metaphor, meta, metamorphize into the, the, theme, the, the final theme in the ring, the immolation scene, the theme that Wagner called in praise of Brunhilde. But certainly a love theme. If, without getting too much into what it means, these are both clearly very important love themes. And very major, uh, <laughs> and, and they're both attached right on one page, actually, on the same page, to, to, uh, to Fricka. So, you know, Fricka is clearly, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, I think we all make this problem. This, maybe this is the problem of those of us who think too much about singers. And I'm going to do that, too, which is that the smaller the role, the less important the character. And that, of course, is not always true at all in Wagner. Freya and Fricka are both extremely, Freya has nothing to say. But she's a terribly important character. Her music is all over the ring. And, and Fricka is a more important character. She has that great Shana uh, in, in, in the first scene of Act Two of the Valkyrie. And it really is a Shana. Uh, uh, Fricka is often the most beautiful of all people in the cast. Of the room. She was very beautiful last night. Very beautiful that one. Yeah. So very Not in the men, however. As much as I like Stephanie Blind, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Yes? Quickly, to go back to the sphere, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile the uh, prominence of uh, contracts and order mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the ring embodied by Wotan with uh, Wagner's personal life, who was a revolutionary and broke contracts all the time? Right. I think, well, that's a very, that's a good point. Uh, and I think that, that there's a lot of ways to answer that question. One question is that, um, Wagner's concept of Wotan, which goes back to the very beginnings of the ring, it um, embodies, I think, a very deep contradiction in Wagner's own life. I don't like trying to read works of art into the lives of, of, of artists. And the reason for that is, is that I think that um, there's so much digestion, so much uh, process into the work of art that it is impossible to take a single thing. Just this morning, I was talking about um, this tendency and even in the most obvious uh, uh, examples, it's dangerous. The most obvious example, of course, is that I, as a kid, studying the life of Tchaikovsky, learned that this was a very depressed man who, in the state of absolute morose depression, after having written the Pathetic Symphony, which is, God knows, one of the most depressing pieces anyone ever wrote, purposely drank water in the midst of a cholera epidemic and killed himself, uh, in effect. And he died at age 53. Um, and, okay, it sounds wonderful, and it really kind of responds to what we like to feel about these things. The fact is, is that Tchaikovsky wrote one piece after the Pathetic Symphony before he died. Anyone know what that was? Well, someone knows, someone's talking to him today. Well, no, Nutcracker. Nutcracker. Nutcracker, one of the happiest, most absolutely you know, delightful pieces imaginable. Um, Mozart's interesting. Another, yeah, well, Mozart, yeah. Right. Mozart, but Mozart was aware he was dying, at least at the very end. And Tchaikovsky was not. Actually, then, I, I don't know if you remember to go back to Tchaikovsky in just a second, it's kind of funny. And because it shows, I think, something very important about uh, music history and, and um, the way we modify things. So when I was a kid, the idea was he was depressed and drank water knowingly during a color epidemic in this sort of moment of fatalistic bloom and to die in a pretty horrible way to suicide, let me tell you. Um, then, then, then there came out this new theory in the late 80s that was very much the rage for about 10 or 15 years, which is that no, he actually didn't die of cholera at all. That he died of poison because a, an affair he was having with a 16-year-old boy who was the son of a Grand Duke had come out. And the Grand Duke had said that he either would commit suicide or face the rest of his life in Siberia. And he decided, and, and with, with great public shame, and he decided to commit suicide instead of having the shame. And this has been completely debunked for the very simple reason that the Grand Duke in question was also gay. And this, indeed, this entire circle of people, this whole school, were all gay. And, and rather openly so, there would have really been no scandal. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't hold water at all. And the real fact, I think, probably overwhelming likelihood, is the one that is the most unattractive. Which is, and this is this, by the way, is backed up by all of the people who knew Tchaikovsky in his time, and who wrote not just in in things that they thought people would see, but in things they never thought that people would see. Which is that Tchaikovsky was an extremely careless man 
who didn't pay attention to things. And during a cholera epidemic in St. Petersburg, he drank water and got cholera because he was a fool and he was careless. And that's not nearly as attractive as he was forced to commit suicide to avoid shame in a, in a homosexual scandal with a 16-year-old or that um, he was plunged into despair to commit suicide by drinking water on purpose to give himself cholera. And I, I'm afraid that these things are, are complicated. So going back to the spirit, I, I think, though, that it's absolutely true in the character of Votan. First thing, Wagner put a great deal of himself into Votan. We know this from the letters to, to Rook. He says, look at Votan. He is the very picture of man as he exists. Uh, and I think any of us, when we picture man as he exists, the person we look at first is who we see in the mirror, to some extent. And so Votan um, obviously dreams of a world that he can control, but that he can somehow control in a way which is fair and free and, and, and just. Um, the, of course, the problem is he immediately, is, well, we see it, he's immediately in trouble. And the implications of what the Norns tell us is, is that the whole concept is wrong. That, and uh, the point in the ring, it seems to me, is not so much that, that um, <clears throat> Votan and Alberich are both bad, but that even if Votan's intentions are good, he is immediately forced into becoming bad in a way that almost more morally compromised than Alberich himself because of the very nature of the desire for control. But Wagner himself um, craves control but, but, uh, as a person and the need for control, the, the need for order. What, what, what the spear represents is order, really. Order, um, the things are kept, control as an order. I mean, I think the idea that Wagner has is, is that there's two kinds of order posited in the ring, social order. The social order posited by the ring, which is slavery, tyranny, and the social order which is posited by the spear, which is um, um, yeah. Constitutional uh, democracy, in a way, you would say. I mean, uh, I think that, um, um, in a way, uh, uh, Derek Cook's point is well taken when he says that um, uh, Votan is often compared to Hitler in modern productions. And actually, a more more accurate assumption would be Votan should be compared to Winston Churchill. Yeah, uh, uh, a great a, a democratic leader who wants to by the rules, but is but is forced in all kinds of extremely morally compromising positions because these rules force him. The force to do so, and a much more interesting figure, ultimately, uh, someone like Winston Churchill. So that, that um, and you know, so I think that the, the, the spear is an extremely important symbol of the ring, but an extremely ambivalent one. Whereas the, the, the music of the uh, ring is, is, is so ambivalent. The ring is not an ambivalent symbol. It seems to me, I mean, the ring is pretty bad when you look at it. The spear, I think it's wrong to see the spear as strictly a bad thing, but I think it, it, it has to be seen perhaps as a failed thing. Uh, um, uh, maybe when we get to Siegfried, we'll talk about why Siegfried breaks the spear and what that means. Uh, 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 we, we can talk and get into that a little more. Yeah, but that's, um, because after all, one thing is to be very clear. Um, at the end of the ring, the, the ring is destroyed. The ring, the ring cycle. The ring is destroyed, and we have some hope of some new, of some new cycle, which will be better. Um, the ring is the world of the ring is hardly one iota better when the spear is destroyed. The destruction of the spear by Siegfried, the act three of uh, Siegfried, certainly doesn't. Leave. The world depicted in Gunnar Dammer is hardly a better world. I mean, it's, it's as bad as anything, not worse. Yeah. We know now when when the sword is broken. You know how the sword was broken. Mm -hmm. The piece we picked up and it was repaired later. Mm -hmm. Not so with the spear though. The spear is never repaired. The spear, is, the spear is never repaired. It's interesting too. I mean, they're both magic, but um, they're different kinds of magic. First thing, the magic of the spear, though we shouldn't get into this, it's really not a rival, but the magic of the sword is magic that was put into it by Votan. The magic of the spear is magic, at least we're now talking about within the stories we're given, is magic which is imbued in it by its very nature when he drank from the wells of wisdom, when he gave up his eye, and drank from the wells of wisdom in the depths of time, and, and took the world ash tree root and or branch and turned it into the spear. So the, 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 ma the power of the spear is something in its essence, something magical in its essence, from its, from its ability. Whereas the magic in the sword is something that Votan is actually, he's, he has enchanted the sword magically. So, I mean, it, uh, it presumably can be, be repaired, and the spear cannot. Yeah? Question, why is Albert's curse so powerful over Wotan? If Wotan okay. is a mighty god... That's a, that's a good question. Um, what, what, what is the power... First thing, Wotan is a mighty god, but he's, for the just very start, just, 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 just as fallible and, and, as, and as weak as everybody else. Um, he's, look, 
Wotan is very, this is one of the great dramatic moments of the ring because it shows us how weak and how strong Wotan is. Wotan is so weak that when Fricka shows him the fallacy of his arguments, he has to basically murder his own son, whom he definitely loves, or at least loves as he understands love. And yet, he is strong enough where he can kill Hunding by just waving his hand at him. I mean, you know, he literally says, gay connection. And he just waves his hand and he's, he drops dead. So Wotan is very strong and yet very weak. As far as it's the curse of the ring, the curse of the ring is sort of implicit. Anybody who's under the ring spell is, is cursed by the ring. And Wotan is, is, is absolutely as much under the ring spell as anyone, maybe more. Uh, but I think we have to think of it not even as a curse. I agree. It just describes what human beings are. Are, and yes. how they respond to the ring. Any, anybody who is a, human, a true human being, Fry is it. Um, is liable to the curse of the ring. The ring, is, it, the ring has its own curse. Alberic's cursing the ring is a marvelous theatrical moment and a very important one from Wagner's musical method because it gives a single moment for us to remember, to associate with that action. And a memorable melody. And a very memorable melody that's attached to it and one which directly grows out of the ring mode in itself. So it's, it's also organically tied. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, you can think of Albert's curse as a self-fulfilling prophecy. It sort of is. That is, you introduce, you say a truth, but you introduce a doubt in the recipient, which in turn is going to bring it about. That's absolutely true. I mean, for instance, the very first thing that Votan says after the murder, the first thing said by anyone, yeah, and the first thing said by anyone is, is by a moment, very ironic, after the murder of Basel, he says, Look, Votan, aren't you glad you gave it up? Your enemies murder each other. And Votan says, powerful indeed seems this curse to me now. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I don't understand the motivation of Fafner to go in a cave with, uh, I mean, if I had all that ring and all that money, I'd do something more interesting than go sleep in a cave. You know, and that that's, a, and that's, a, that's an excellent question and an excellent comment. And I think it says something about the nature of the, of the ring and its curse. Albrecht says that having the ring, all, all, if you have the ring, all you're consumed with is fear that you're going to lose it. And so instead of enjoying it, he's just trying to be as defensive as he can. And he thinks the most offensive thing I can do is put the tarnel on, turn myself into the most fearsome being I can be, which is a dragon, and find some cave and sit there and guard everything. Because that's the nature of, in other words, that's the nature of the ring. That, that it, it, it gives no enjoyment whatsoever to who has it, only can. I still don't quite understand the power of the ring. Was that because it was from the Rheingold, or was it forged by Albrecht, or where does the power of the ring come okay, from? Okay, that's, that's a question that not everybody has the same answer to. My own feeling is the following, um, that certainly there is some, there is somehow, we certainly cannot say there is no power, no actual physical manifest power in the ring, because we do see it. If Wagner goes out of his way, we should see it three times. Three times, Albrecht kisses the ring. We hear a very specific musical formula, which I played this, this one, which I played before. This special version of the woe motive. And every time we hear that particular formula, we should remember that moment. He kisses the ring, and the, the Nibelungs go nuts. They, have, they lose any vestige of their ability to resist him or will or anything. They immediately cower. So I think that we have to buy that into the story. Father is really going out of his way for us to buy that into the story. So that there is some power. But we never see anybody else derive any power whatsoever from the ring. Um, uh, for instance, Brunhilde has the ring. Uh, and, she, and she knows about the ring. She knows the ring's power. And so when, when Siegfried in the guise of Gunther comes and tries to rape her, she holds it up and says, you can't touch me with this ring on my finger. This ring makes me strong as steel. That's literally what she says. And so he just tears it off the finger. It doesn't, doesn't seem to help her at all. Um, by the way, I firmly believe that Brunhilde is just as much under the ring's curse as anyone else, but that's, that's good or never, we'll get into that in um, It's just manifests, it's manifests itself in a totally different way because she's a totally different kind of person. We're talking about the power of the ring, though. Other than that power that Albrecht shows, the ring has an enormous amount of power. And the power is the power of the curse, which is the power of the nature of the ring. That people are consumed by desire to have it, and they see in it that which they most uh, keenly desire. Fricka sees the, the ring as the tool that will keep Wotan by her side forever, as a faithful, loving husband. Donner sees the ring as the ultimate weapon by which he can subdue the world militarily, because that's what Donner does. He's the god who fights. 
Wotan sees the ring as the ultimate, he says this makes me the mightiest and most exalted of all. That's what he says when he first puts it on his finger. This exalts me to the mightiest of might. He looks at that, he wants might, he wants power. Albert, of course, wants money, but he wants power too, actually. He sees money as a means of power. Um, um, so people seem to see in the ring what they want. Actually, what, they, what, is, what does Brunhilde see in the ring? Why won't she give it up? Connection with uh, Siegfried. Well, yeah, she says, it's my love token to Siegfried. Let me ask you a question. Would she have loved Siegfried, or Siegfried loved her any less if she'd given up the ring? No, no, there's no power in the ring. The ring isn't the love of Siegfried and, and, and Brunhilde. It has no power, but she's stupidly, foolishly, because she's under the ring's power, won't give up the ring. Of course she should have given up the ring. I mean, I don't know if, how much it would have changed things, but of course she should have given up the ring. And Voltron's argument is absolutely, the music also tells us that Wagner agrees with me, but she's, she's, she, the ring to her is, says, this is my love for Siegfried. No, she, the ring means as much to her in, in its own way as it did to Faulkner. It's just that she, Faulkner was Faulkner and Brunhilde is Brunhilde. They're mighty different people. That's but all. Siegfried but the, doesn't seem to care no, about the ring. He doesn't know what it means. That's <laughs> absolutely right. The one person who cares the ring around who doesn't even give a damn. As he says, if the Rhine maidens had, had not threatened me, but just said, give us the ring, he would have given it to him. Because Siegfried is alone, is actually a live and fryer. Uh, right That's right. Yeah. That's right. Siegfried, in that respect, until the very end, until the very end, is like frying them. He does not care. Yeah. And, and, and your theory that it's because he doesn't have a past, is there something to that? Yeah. Siegfried is the one character who, who, who seems to have little little sense of that. He just lives. Yes? Yeah, was, uh, Albert placed a curse on the ring, but when Albert stole the ring, was it an inherent curse on him in having the ring? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in a way, yes. In a way, Albrecht is the most cursed of everybody. Uh, uh, I mean, it's true that Albrecht is the only person who seems to have physical power from the ring. He's the only one who's actually derived any benefit whatsoever from the ring. But from a deeper level, the benefit, in Wagner's view of things, that he's gotten from the ring is certainly nil. I mean, if Wagner seems in the ring, Wagner seems to think that the highest good is joy, and the ability to, 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 to enjoy love and to, to have fellow feeling and sympathy and compassion for other people and all these sorts of things. Albrecht may have the ring and he can get as rich as long as he has it. He can get as rich as he wants and he can enslave the Nibelungs. But he certainly doesn't seem to be happy um, or, or, or content. And as a matter of fact, most of the things he says in the purse is already true of him too. He says, he who has it will be consumed by fear that he'll lose it. Well, that's certainly was his case. Why, he have, why does he build the Tarnhelm, for instance, as a means to keep himself as, as a defense mechanism, which is exactly what Thoughtfer uses it for, too. That was Somebody who has asked a question. That was his deal. That was his deal, yeah. That's right. Uh, the Volta has the ring, but Wagner has the ring. Yeah. And he, the ring doesn't have any power. Right. It doesn't help him at all. No, no. 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 Give the giant yeah, yeah, but it doesn't give the giant any power either, as far as we can. For that matter, Siegfried certainly kills the giant without any particular problem, even though he's turned himself into a dragon. Because he's just a dragon. The fact that he has the ring doesn't help him a bit. On the contrary, in a certain kind of way, having the ring makes you more vulnerable. Yes. Because everybody else wants it. So, you know, it's, the ring is really of no use to anyone. Yeah? Why the ring, why, why did the ring, the, the, the rhyme age, want the ring back so badly if they didn't ever exercise any power? Oh, no, that's different. Uh, that's different. The rhyme, the rhyme daughters don't want the ring back. They want the rhyme gold back. The ring is made from the rhyme gold. And the presumption is, is that if the ring is given back to the rhyme maidens, that the rhyme gold will be restored. That the ring will restore, that having it back, they can restore with, I guess it has enough of the initial essence that it can restore the Rheingold to the Rhine. The Rheingold is what lights the Rhine. It puts light in the Rhine. The symbolism of the Rheingold, the Rheingold is joy. The Rheingold is the existence of joy and, and everything that's positive in the world. So the, for the Rhine maids to get the, the, the ring back is to them all important. It's the only thing that's important. By the way, that's another, talking about my, you know, remember they sing, one of the most beautiful places in, 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 in at the very end when they come back. That, by the way, is certainly one of Wagner's great inspirations, is having theirs be the last thing. And, and they sing, when they come back, something we have not heard them sing before, but that we'll hear over and over again. You know, first thing, they've always had this harmonization before, or it's very, very bright, but now already it's much more poignant.
they alternate the, the major one with a, and a particularly beautiful chord. So they, they themselves, and we'll, we'll, we will always hear this, this alternation any time in the future in the ring um, at, when, we, when we'll hear the Ryan, the Ryan Mains music again. That's not my phone, is it? Yes? Question on the title. Why did Wagner bestow a certain ownership by saying that he the room? Because the Nibelung is the one who made the ring. It is his ring. It's his ring because he made it. He made it. Yeah, the right one is his, but he made the ring. So it is, it is certainly. And one of the big mistakes that you hear very often here, you usually hear people are pretty much correct with that. When I was a kid, I used often to hear that transcribed. They were, they were confusing des in German, which of course is singular, with de in French spelled the same way, which is plural. And they would say, the Nibelungs, the ring of the Nibelungs, the ring of the Nibelungs, as if all the Nibelungs have the ring. Of course, that's not what it means. It means the ring des Nibelung. In that case, the one Nibelung is, is, um, is Elbridge. Because Nibelung is a weak noun. And so, even though Nibelung is singular, if it's in the genitive des Nibelung, de Nibelung, de Nibelung, and it's one of those words, like student, uh, that does that anyway. Or a variant. Which that's what it would be if it were. But I mean, he doesn't call it that. He doesn't call it Delling Delling Delling. He calls it Delling Delling Delling, which is one. Yeah. I think we just about have to stop. Does this emphasis on contracts uh, and their central role as representative of the sphere uh, link up at all to the uh, the critical? Composition, particularly by Shaw, that at least at the outset, when this was being written, Wagner's vision uh, was a political one was, was, uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a critique of industrial capitalism, which essentially exists based on a contract. contract. Oh, absolutely. Sure. It was a, uh, a critique on a, on a world system that was that, that depended on being beholden <coughs> instead, of, uh, instead of free cooperation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think there's. By the way, I was thinking about contracts. Votan lo still loves contracts. He never loses his love of contracts. Can we think of another example of Votan's manifestation of his love of contracts later in the ring? Contracts. It's like a contract. It's a bargain, a deal. The scene with Mima. He comes on stage and immediately says, uh, I'll wager my head that, 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 that I can answer any three questions you can ask me. He sets it right up again. It's, again, what has he done? He's, he's embroiled Mima. Into his, so yes, he's, he's been, he seems to be really big on that. And has, hasn't gotten out of the system yet. And he does it on his spear. I mean, he does the whole, his spear is very present, especially in the last part of that, of, of his third answer. I mean, actually get one of the most magnificent uh, occurrences of the ring, of the spear mode of the whole ring, and we usually get it with a huge clap. We should get it. That was one thing I wanted to mention. Very spectacular. It is a good one for a director's idea. In act one of Curtis Emmer, having walk on at the moment where they have the blood probably. Yeah, and have this. Have this. Have this. Yeah. Except that the spear is broken. You have to have pieces of it. But yeah. Um, why not? Here's a, that's an interesting, interesting concept. Here's, a, here's one last question, and, and then I think we should go. Um, we were talking about the ring. We saw the ring used three times in, um, in, in the Rheingold that we never see it used again. By used, I mean it's actually used and something happens. Albert kisses it and something happens, or holds it up in the air and something happens. Um, um, do we ever see the spear used in the ring? We do. But could you tell me where we see the spear used? We're actually, you know, the spear is usually just a prop. But, uh, and he can or can't have it. But even almost any stage director can't do without the spear in uh, at least, I would say, three places in the ring that I can think of. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. No, no, that's just production. He shatters Sigmund's But he shatters Siegfried's sword with it. That's right. <laughs> He's, he causes Sig Sigmund's death. He's, he, no, he's, that's right. He's, he shatters. Um, the sword, Zygmunt's sword with it. That's, that's not the first time, but that is certainly one time that we see the spear in action. Yes, that's a very important time. That's very, very significant. He, with the spear, uh, conjures up Loga, who now, that's Loga, that fire, it's very important to remember that. That fire is Loga. That's, Loga has now been turned back into fire. He was fire before, and, and Botan turns him in, somehow manages to magically make that fire become the person, the, the demigod, Loga. And, but now, Logan at the end tells us he's starting to wish he were back in fire again, and Votan fulfills his wish. He does so rather violently in his production. Um, yeah?
Just a, a quick question about it. For some reason in my head, I have it in my mind that somewhere in the libretto of the ring there is a reference to uh, Votan's spear in the breast of Loga. Yes, absolutely. That's the, we, we hear it. That's the Norns. The Norns say. Okay, so what I thought this came to mind at the end of the video yesterday when Loga was pierced by Votan. Uh huh. And it that's the, that, you know. It was like, the right thing at the wrong time. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that reference of like why we uh, no, Okay, let me let me find it. Here. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Okay. Um there's not here. It'll be the fire. Okay. By the spears enchantment, Votan enthralled Loga. In other words, turned him into a fire. Help he gave to the god. In other words, no, this is even before. Votan, with the spear's help, enchanted the fire that was Loga and turned him into the sky. And he and, and, repa and repaid him by, by helping him. Loga, I guess, helped him, although it was dubious help. From his galling fetters, freedom to win, he gnawed the runes of the shaft. So we learned some very interesting things I never even thought about. They say that, that he actually gnawed the runes, the holy runes on the shaft of the spear, with fire. Then, with the mighty spell of the spear point, Votan confined him. That's the end of, of Valkyra. This is amazing, condensed history of the world here. Flaming around Brunhilda's rock. And then she says, with the shattered spear shaft's piercing splinter, 